It's time to start. Yes, it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, offering me a crowded classroom <laughs> at my last day of professional life. <laughs> uh, I'm now 70 and I, I am at a tour to say goodbye to all the professional communities I've been a member of and TA is the last one. From tomorrow on I'm only available private and maybe for a conversation but not business of any kind. And I have uh, to warn you, because uh, you really will go through three hours of presentations interrupted by a guided imagery, so that you have something from letting go and dreaming. Uh, as I wrote in the program, um, I developed over decades concepts and approaches for systemic TA and this is now not for teaching them or um, experiential work with it or demonstrating it in uh, consultations. It's only just to give, go through, of these, uh, to, uh, through these many concepts with you, showing you one or two slides for each concept and giving you some hints what is the essence of it? Why did I develop that? And uh, we are a sharing company. This means all our concepts are free available for you as audios, videos. You will get all the charts if you want. You will get all the material and we uh, put in a lot of effort to prepare all these materials that you easy can I import them into your work with your name on it. So we are, at a, we are prepared at a maximum to offer you to study more and use it. And I want today only saying goodbye, uh, telling you what, what is there. And, if, and certainly do not expect that uh, I can explain all these concepts. I give you some hints. And if you are interested in on the charts and they are available for you, I don't know whether uh, people here uh, make it available. I will write down our email address and you will find them uh, on our website within, I don't know how quick we are, uh, the charts next week. And in many charts, there is a link directly to the material so that you, so that you don't have to search for it. And you will have, if you get, if you get the two. <laughs> and if you get the charts, uh, then you will have the links uh, active on these charts. So I wanted to tell you this in, uh, before I begin that in case you have any other expectations, please switch to another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on these things for decades and uh, at least three decades and you will have three hours of it. And so in my main uh, identifications, I'm a developer. This is why I developed a lot. I have too much material. I guess we will not get through. I do my best. And the rest will still be on the charts with the links where you can read more if one of or the other of the keywords triggers you and you are interested in what it is all about. Can you please speak very loud? So yeah, if, if, if it's not loud enough, remind me, please. Thank you. Is this now loud enough this way? Okay. Today I'm working, not me, my company. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> is working in the organizational field. Uh, we train professionals 
uh, in systemic consulting, in, uh, in organizational coaching, in TA, uh, and we have many of the famous companies that are usually our customers, and we have about 5,000 alumni, people who went through a two years course at our institute. And we have a very vivid internet network where they do super, uh, collegial supervision and uh, offer each other jobs and hints and all that. It's really a vivid community. And this is our motto, culture emerges from culture and examples set the stage. We firmly believe that a complex organization cannot be organized only by logic means. It must have a culture and everybody needs to understand and accept uh, this culture so that it can get organ stay organized and develop further and it's not only dependent on one person like uh, uh, the role I took for so many years uh, to further develop. Um, I will not go through it, I just, uh, you can have a glance at it, these are the 10 points uh, of my presentation, uh, if you see the 10th points, it uh, is, uh, consists of 15 keywords, also there will be enough material. Uh, as you may have noticed, this session is taped so that you and others who are not here can uh, see that on YouTube. This means if you are here and speak up that you accept that you will be on YouTube. If you don't want that, please do not speak up. <laughs> we can speak later. <laughs> is that okay? Okay. Why culture? I just said it. Culture is not a, a sharply defined term. Uh, it's what we call an umbrella term. And there are many ingredients how reality is shaped, consciously and unconsciously, and habitually and creatively. As I will outline more later, I think habits are a very important factor. We all develop a lot of habits, associations develop habits, uh, training systems develop habits, and we very often do not know how stabilized these habits are and how difficult it is really to change something. Many of you may have had the experience how difficult it is it is to change uh, cultural habits. And without defining that very exactly, uh, the notion is that culture is needed to manage complex organizations. Everybody needs to have a feeling what is like this culture or not. Not a directive, not a exact rule, really a feeling about the essentials so that they can behave in line of the cultural ideas and very flexible on the other side. And culture is not only a culture of uh, exchanging good ideas and self-experience but because we are working for companies and other organizations, it's a culture of performance. We are always somehow directed to the reason why this company exists. And if you do not have uh, a dialogue with these reasons and decide whether you want to contribute to it or not, uh, you do not have a good standing in, as a partner for the company. And certainly, it's a culture of work life because many, many, many people spend a big part of their lives at work and this is why working is a lifestyle and my, perso my personal uh, 
convic um, conviction is that we only should support uh, companies that do something for people, that human life gets better. If, if we do not at least have the hope, I would not spend my life energy to support these companies. Um, this is a picture that helps you to convince maybe the one or the other leader of a company why it makes sense to invest into building up culture. Because everybody has the experience, if you start result-oriented without clarifying whether you are ready for it, then in the beginning you have the illusion you are prepared and, and more down the way you get more and more into cultural problems and you need more and more energy to solve these cultural problems <coughs> and after, this is a metaphor certainly, after a specific amount of time you will have spent more on dealing with cultural, cultural problems than reached uh, oriented to your results. And this is why from the beginning on you should invest into the culture of performance. But culture does not mean be nice to each other. I will just explain this more later. Culture meets, and this is why this is starting here, taking examples of the work of a company for what they are together and using these examples not to reach results in the first step, but to use it, how can we work together to develop good solutions for these examples. It's, and so this is an investment into culture. Also, it's a task-oriented example. The focus and the priority in the process is learning and culture development. And if you do this enough with the relevant people, and you will hear many concepts for that, then after the same amount of time, you will have much more results. And you do not have, hopefully, so many cultural problems to solve. And this is a problem for an association uh, that is too much uh, problem-oriented, because they make their living of solving problems. We make our living in building up culture. And my experience is, since I gave up to analyze games, for example, many years ago, people lose interest in playing games in my seminars. So we have to be careful not to introduce the reality uh, and, and support the reality we offer ourselves then as a helper later on. Now I come to transactional analysis. As you may know, I've been in TA now for 41 years. And I've been very engaged first in psychotherapy of different kinds, then more and more in organizational culture, uh, uh, consulting. And uh, today we are specialized in the organizational field. And I always struggled with the classical TA somehow because it did not fit the organizational field. But we have here a cultural habits of the TA associations that as soon as you ask what is TA, you have to draw, draw three circles. Also in many cases it doesn't make any sense. And my definition, I guess it was in 90, maybe 98, 91 or so or earlier was, Transaction, uh, transactional analysis is an approach to better co-creating reality through communication. Reality is also created through laws, through buildings, through money, through all things. And this is not our business. Our business, what can we do with communication? And for me, a transactional analyst is somebody who is qualified to develop communication in a way that's a chance that there is co-creation of reality and further development just gets better. And it's not important that he, has, he draws arrows or circles all time. 
the identity of a transactional analyst, analyst in this field, at least, should be detached from these classical, classical science of identification. And for me, it's a, there are different um, professions and different activities uh, that are called transactional analysis, and it's important to differentiate between them. And one is just to be a practitioner, a communication practitioner in any field, and TA helps you to be a better communication practitioner. This is what we usually have as a level one examination. And TA is also a teaching and supervising system and that certification system. And the culture of this system has a, has a lot to do with the self-understanding of the practitioner, the self-confidence, and this is why we, we need to um, care for this cultural system of teaching, supervision, and certification because it produces identity and reality through the practitioners into the world. And really, I'm so thankful to TA. When I started in 1976, it was, I was in, in a Gestalt training in Los Angeles, and the Gestalt trainer asked me and some friends whether we want to go to a conference to San Francisco up the highway number one, and certainly we wanted. And there was in a hotel a conference. I didn't know anything about TA, and there was a guy who showed everybody. And ITA had about 10,000 members at that time. Said he lost weight, and everybody applauded. <laughs> this seemed a bit strange to me. <laughs> this, later, I hear this was Bob Goulding. <laughs> But I liked uh, what I found at this conference, and I wrote the books, uh, uh, I'm OK, you are no OK, and uh, TA in psychotherapy and all these things. And then when I get, got back to Germany, I started TA training, because uh, just at that time, uh, a TA training, Aline Moore trainer, started uh, a training group in Heidelberg. And so I stayed for 41 years. And uh, really, I highly estimate the teaching, supervision, and certification system of TA. It might have become a bit too complicated. <laughs> but the basic culture uh, was really good, and I hope it still is. I'm not so much in touch with it since 10 years or so. So. And because it's a system of associations that is carrying this teaching, supervision, and certification system, it's important to have a good culture of the association. For example, in trusting the people you have trained. In the German association, I had some problems with the idea of the teachers that even if somebody had a level one exam, they did not trust them to represent TA in their professional field without ongoing supervision by a teacher. This was, a, for me, a difficult part of non-trusting uh, the people we have trained ourselves. Uh, for me, it's very important uh, that TA develops really into different fields, and we do not expect that the qualification in one field automatically leads to qualification in another field. We really have to separate that. And uh, I don't know where we are now, but for many, many, many years, it was always psychotherapy that dominated the thinking and ideas in other fields. And I always argument, argued for have giving those fields our own self-definition and self-understanding and having a, a critical discussion with each other about what the standards are. Because, for example, in the organizational fields, in most of the cases, biographical work does not make sense. You can do the things that a psychotherapist usually thinks should do via biographical work 
without biographical work. This is uh, an import of a tradition of a, of a psychotherapy profession into the organizations that must be looked at very critically. So I promised in the announcements that I first will give you a brief explanations on the role concept for which I got the Eric Byrne Memorial Award 2007. And it's based on the ego state concept, as you see, but it's enlarged. It's a role, it's a coherent system of attitudes, feelings, behaviors, perspective on reality, in TA it's usually called frame of reference, and the accompanying relationship. What are my ideas, how this should be done together? So, the smallest unit of a personality is the role, defined like that. And personality is a portfolio of these roles. Played on the stages of my life in the place that are enacted there. There is no other person. I know this is a didactic definition, but I want, I, I like, always like that Ari Burns said, TA is for real persons and real life situations. And all concepts that cannot be clearly defined as real persons, acting, experiencing, and real life situations they are in, uh, are <coughs> somewhere besides that. I'm not saying this is invalid, but this concept is for really uh, observing people as acting within their roles on the stages of their life. And where is the uniqueness of a person? The uniqueness is in the way the person expresses these roles. So be human within your roles, not besides your professional roles, organizational roles. And these concepts uh, um, connect personalities with the place and the stages of their world. So it's a concept, it's not only look back at the personality, it's always the personality in a context, dealing with the content, playing a role, and usually this is uh, within a play where others play with them. So the interplay is always a part of our personality. And it's not added afterwards, this is part of the definition from the beginning on. Graham Barthes once said TA has, is finished, a concept that deletes context and contents doesn't have any future. He's a BMA winner. And somehow he is right, so it's good to, but I think it can be developed further to include context and content, and this is what I always try to do. And there are, like ego states, thousands of ego states, you certainly can define thousands of roles. I, out of didactic reason, I define the three worlds personality model. Personali personality are uh, my roles in my private world. Günther Mohr dif differentiated between family, small world, private roles, and political. You can do that if that makes any sense. If, you, if you, this difference makes a difference for you, then you can uh, subdivide all the roles in whatever categories you want. But it makes a difference, for example, in um, supervision, when you have, somebody comes with a leadership problem in his, act, his actual company. And if you come to the conclusion, let's start with the professional thing because 
my hunch is that your leadership problem has to do with a professional development that is not yours. The problems arise actually in this company, but they may not be a problem of this organizational role, but a problem of your professional development. And then you focus uh, in direction of the professional world. And this is different as if you say, okay, it seems to me that, and you have done, uh, been a leader in many other uh, contexts before, this works fine, but it doesn't work in this company. Then it might be a problem of the organizational role, and then we have a different uh, um, way to go with our supervision. And it might also be that uh, the leadership problems have not been there until two years ago, now they are there, and this might have to do with crisis in private life. And this gives the supervision a third, very different direction. And because you always have to decide what focus first, also you are looking uh, at the interconnections, uh, and this is why you can use this uh, personality model. You can also use it to see whether there's a balance between the fields and also. Many things have been done with that. It's the most known of my concept. I heard it is taught in Japan and elsewhere. And to, according to the tradition of TA, you can transfer the personality model, model in role areas. So these are my organizational roles, these are my professional roles, and these are my private roles. For example, we are doing specific self-experience workshops only on organizational roles. How do I experience, I, I, how do I experience myself in these all kinds of organizational roles, and how do I manage to combine them, and how is this compatible with the context I am in? And it's still self-experience, but it doesn't usually not have to do anything with biography. And what you can do then is uh, to use all the elements of your transactional analysis, your tools to uh, think about whether uh, this was a basic idea of Eric Byrne, are we are we really on, on a co um, complementary level when we try to communicate? He has done this with the ego states, but you can also do it with the roles. And this example could be like, the boss comes in and wants to talk to the consultant about how many hours he is spending for one customer. And in what way he works with this customer in order uh, not to have too many hours. What level makes sense as a strategy of the organization and the cult, uh, consulting strategy of this organization. And if the consultant thinks about, in his, about that in his role as a member of this company, then the answer is on a complementary level. But he, he or she may switch to a professional discussion. I'm sure that people do not feel understood if they do not have enough money. They always feel like they, they are not uh, safe enough if they do not have many hours and so on. And acts like it's a dispute between two professionals of two different schools or mindsets. And this is uh, what classically was called in TA cross transaction because he changes the roles out of which he's trying to communicate with the boss. This is a non-complementary transaction. And instead of going, uh, accepting this argue on this professional role level, it's important that the boss first said, let's talk about that as a strategy of this company. And remind, I remind you that you are a member of this company and we have a business plan, a strategy, and uh, you need to respond to that when you discuss with me the idea how, uh, what kind of services will we offer to our customers. 
And if this works and the other person reminds himself, oh yes, sir, I'm talking as a company member, then they may buy, be back on a complementary level. And still it might be, uh, as we had it in classical TA, there is a psychological background dynamic on the private level, maybe a male competition thing or things like that. I do not exclude that, but it's not the basic uh, focus for an organizational consultant to put ideas like this into the foreground. The basic strategy of an organizational uh, consultant is to help stabilize the communication levels and the role uh, organizations of the people involved so that they have a kind of adult communication and this dynamic, even it might still be there, fades more and more into the background. So you fill up the foreground and leave uh, things like psychological interpretation into the background. Unless there's a specific reason to do that, put it in the foreground, but not as a habit because you have learned that. And you can work with classical TA concepts, uh, also with roles. So fixed ego states, role fixation, somebody who is always the boss, certainly. Or role exclusion, somebody wants to be your friend, but avoids. To be your boss also, you cannot organize, as a team cannot organize uh, itself because it needs uh, to have a de definition of priorities and this only can be done by the boss. In case there are different ideas and the discussion will never end. And role confusion, uh, we had just this example before, role confusion somebody thinks that he acts as a member of a consulting company, but it's not clear that he acts like a member of a, of a psychotherapy association who wants to, to uh, get more and more in the organizational field. So it's a role confusion. The interests are different. Role contamination. Uh, if you read the book, I, I guess it was McCormick, on intuition and ego states. Uh, there is written that one of the first examples Eric Byrne made was the role confusion of a law on a child. He, had, he was uh, consulting a lawyer and suddenly he had the intuitive vision that there is a, a child also playing within that. And the first drawing of a confusion uh, Eric Byrne made was the confusion between uh, professional role of a lawyer and a private role of a child. So this is many, many years ago. So you can work with the ideas of role habits, what we know as rackets, and with all the focus ideas that you have learned in classical TA. Getting back to the definition for TA, it's uh, co-creating reality through communication. Uh, I've developed many concepts that describe communication in a way that you can ask clever questions whether it's, it's fitting to each other and it's a chance for co-creating. I firmly believe that the, our ages uh, are burdened with dissociation. Everybody invents something and develops it somewhere and the responsibility of making it integrative and a company leader must integrate things. He, can, he cannot uh, uh, go with you on, on an idea, uh, uh, enlarge an idea of any psychological other school only because he always has to think about how can we include that into our performance processes. 
and how can we include that in the competence of our, of our uh, members. So it's always a question of how can we make, help people to share reality and not dealing with, on, and not missing, or dealing with the problems of not sufficiently sharing. And how can we make people uh, co-creating? Because today uh, we have more and more percentage of necessary development during work. So many have to be co-creative and one alone can, cannot do it. So this is uh, what is written here in blue, 2016. This is a hint on a list of my English, uh, uh, of my written publications in English. And this uh, list will be uh, linked in, in, in a later chart. So you, you, if you are interested in that point more, you go to the list of my publications in English and in the list there are the links. You click on the link and you will have the paper and can directly read it. One of the concepts I've developed uh, to, to help us to change our thinking is uh, uh, communication as a cultural encounter. Usually we are still thinking in the mechanical communication models. This means if the center is working right, the channel is okay, then we know what will be, uh, uh, what um, will be reach the receiver. But this is not true for living organism. Uh, Bateson said that in a saying, he said if you have a football and you can uh, calculate exactly how you kick this football, you can calculate exactly where this football will fly. If this is not a football, but a dog, it's different. <laughs> and that's the situation of communication between living systems. Each system, in the first place, and this is also brain research, is saying each cell which is reached by a visual impression at the same time is reached by a hundred times of internal messages from the brain. So it's always, al always only a small part of the input was is really communicated. The rest is logic of self-organization. And this is why we can be astonished that we can communicate at all. And this uh, picture shows you that real uh, each um, engaged organization is in the first place uh, oriented to its own culture and world understanding and comfort and all these things. And usually, if you do not somehow reach this culture, uh, then there will no com be no communication. So, Usually 90% should be, in case if you are uh, educated in one culture, let's say within a TA association, then the hope is that at 70% if you talk about something, the other person has learned to decode it in a similar way. As soon as if you go to Asia and meet people who never heard something about TA, you know you cannot communicate. And this is normal. So. It has to be invested a lot of energy to build the basis for understanding each other through communication. And if it doesn't work, it's not wrong. It only shows you there's a challenge you did not yet meet. So, uh, transactional analysts, analysts and other communication professionals uh, should be specialists to understand how different cultures meet each other and also to make it in an economic way oriented to a common integrated goal. And for this you can, for example, use 
uh, the concepts of the shift shul, the sexist shul. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's coming from the therapeutic field. And usually, it's the idea that the therapist know, knows what is the right reality, and the patient has to learn from the therapist how the right reality should be. This might be OK with psychotics. But if you use the encounter of realities besides that, for example, in the company, certainly nobody uh, has the right to define what is the right communication or what is the right reality. They have to meet each other and find out whether they live somehow in a shared reality. And then you can use these four levels, the shifts defined in a very similar way. If you find out we are not together, not to get into a struggle and def define each other as pathological or whatever, but really first to find out in which, what is your reality at this point? And then you can use the hierarchy we have learned from the shifts. First, let's find out whether we share perspectives. And if the boss of the company only thinks in profit and money and you think in comfort of members of the, uh, of the company, then you are not together. It, it doesn't make sense to discuss. You first have to fi find somehow a, com a common level. See, let's talk about the comfort uh, of the members, or let's talk about what do you need in the long run to have enough profit. What is your idea? What this, does this have to do with the comfort of members or so? And then you try to uh, discuss with each other un until you find some kind of shared perspectives and the facts to be taken in account. And if you do not meet each other at that point, there is no further communication meaningful. And then shared meaning and relevance of perspectives and facts and shared understanding of how people and things interact. So it's more and more a complex understanding. What, how does this make a reality system, in my view? And then at the last point, you come to the question of responsibility. What, who, who has what to do to come to a shared result in moving reality? But it's the last point, not the first point. <coughs> Certainly, you cannot do this at every point of misunderstanding. But at some examples, you can do it and found out, find out whether each other, we, we can learn from each other how the other person is thinking and organizing their picture of reality. And so uh, if we understand a lot about each other, the chances that we further on intuitively match this is much better. And only from time to time we have really take examples and analyze them. Knowing that this analytical access is not covering all the communication levels that are involved. But it's a, it's a guideline to do it more in an adult way. And to make clear that people are acting on many levels of communication. We have this picture. Uh, <clears throat> we have a conscious methodological level. If you ask people involved, they give you an idea what they are trying to communicate and how they are doing that. And certainly, as we know, there is a lot of unconscious, intuitive, uh, bargaining, finding out who the other person is, what intention does the other person have, can I trust this other person, and all <coughs> these things. And this is working at the same time. And the idea is, in order to build up a multi-layer communication culture, that uh, you use examples that everybody understands 
uh, what hints of the other person uh, he is um, proceeding with, with, within. And on what do I react if I listen to you? I do not react to the logic of, of your contract offer, for example. I react on the intuition uh, that I do not believe you, that you can keep that for a long time, what you promise me. And it, this, might, this, this is coming up within me, and usually I do not notice this. This is why I'm looking for thoughts in the contract. But uh, these are not the thoughts in the contract. This is my impression of not being able to trust you. And then, uh, and if you, we are, do not have only two people, maybe a group around that, we can find, do, do others also have this kind of picture? Do they have ideas how this intuition is coming up? How do they react on the same uh, intuition? And so, uh, you, we, we call this mirroring, and we do that a lot in our work. And so you get more and more a multi-layer clarification culture. And it helps a lot because if, if you have a, a trusting culture, within you do that, um, you are so glad that you, real, you get the real information how the other person, why the other person is reacting to you in this or that way. You do not get a superficial, technical, methodical answer that is not understandable or if you try to act on this answer, it will not change the situation. So it's a, a chance really to get within the person aware of what, is, what are the background levels I'm acting on and it's um, an invitation into exchanging and dialoguing on these levels and finding a way uh, of clarification. This is called the dialogue model of communication. Altogether, we believe that we should do something if we work for a company or an organization to help them to dialogue with each other. Dialogue is, has two meanings. One is using words, and the other is um, understanding through exchange. And this is not only the logic of words, this is all, all what is transported through words and besides words. So in order, and because most of us are not well trained in this subject, this is important that we uh, build uh, a learning partnership so that we help people to adopt uh, attitudes that we have together to learn what happens between us while we are trying to share reality and create reality together. And also we might have uh, level differences in, for example, our organization roles or in our financial potency or whatever. Concerning this learning process, we are on an equal eye level. And it's important to differentiate between these different levels. And I always, uh, when I do a consulting, I always do first uh, equal eye level uh, contracting with the other person. Uh, I, I try to explain how I work, how I think, that the other person at any point can say, I do not understand this, so or, or whatever. Uh, really, let's go, to a, let's go to a meta level together and discuss what we are doing here now, and then go back into the roles we have uh, committed ourselves. So, it's the attitude of experimenting. None of us knows. We have a lot of knowledge we bring in, but we have to experiment together what can be successful and what not. And this is exper experimenting with our relationship here and now, but usually 
the focus of our communication is not our communication situation here and now, but there and then. And help people to adopt an attitude also with others to build up this experimenting equal eye level dialogue relationship. Is it strenuous for you? Is that right? Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That for me, it's okay if people leave, if they find out it's, it's not what they wanted or, or they have developed different interests, but I do, I do not want that all of you think so but do not dare to go away. <laughs> so the next concept is um, one of the second famous of my concepts. This is the responsibility, sharing responsibility. Again, something to read. Again, one of the videos where I explain that extensively in a video, what I will not do now. But I show you the picture of it. For me, responsibility is being responsible, being able to respond. It has to do with questions that arise and clarification who has to give what kind of answers to these questions. This is responsibility. And for me, responsibility, at least four questions should be clarified in order to build up a valid responsibility system. Starting with the person, am I willing to respond? Sometimes you talk about qualification, but it's not the qualification, it's because the person is not motivated. And this is a different case. You have a dis different discussion then. So a question of values, of willingness, of engagement. Some people are engaged, but not, not competent. They just do not know what they need to know to, f uh, to fill in their roles. So we have very clearly to talk about what qualifications are necessary to respond to these questions. And, it, and you cannot replace being engaged, uh, you cannot replace competence by being engaged. You need also to become competent. So knowledge has an important, plays an important role. And when, as a systemic uh, consultant, when we were, young and wild, uh, <laughs> uh, we thought when we can detect patterns of communication, then we know everything. And, and patterns are everywhere. This is why we are competent every way. The older I get, the more <laughs> I'm convinced this is bullshit. <laughs> Certainly can we describe any kind of pattern, but is, is it relevant? We need felt field competence, we need content competence, and even if we are, in the first place, psychology-oriented communicators, we cannot neglect these uh, ingredients. And we should not be hired if we do not have any idea about the field. We have two-thirds of our participants are people from within companies and uh, they learn that they do not hire consultants from outside who are not willing really to learn uh, uh, and build up field qualifications. I come to a competence formula that is covering this later. So this is of the side of the person, but responsibility in organizational roles is always a question of matching. So the organization has also to offer something it has to offer you the resources you need to answer the questions and give you the power, if the organization can give you the power. Uh, uh, for example, hi hierarchical power can be given by the organization. We have other forms of power, I come to that later, that cannot be given by uh, authorization hierarchically. And as a person, as an individual, 
uh, the organization should expect that you really do it. You are obliged to do it. And if you don't do it, it should have consequences. Otherwise, you have not a fully clarified question of responsibility. So it's, it's a meeting between uh, a attitudes of the person and attitudes of the organization. And only if this matches, there's a chance really to cover responsibility. And, if, uh, and some people try, for example, they come to your training groups and want to learn more and more ability because they neglect, as, as, as they do not understand that they need the resources to do it and the support from the hierarchy. And if they try to replace it by engagement and competence, then the individual in the organization is overburdened and will go into a burnout. And, and if you as a coach uh, support the system, you're not doing right. You should think about together with this person what the person has to learn to confront the organization with the ingredients the organization has to offer. And there's another differentiation we make. This is responsible for and responsible related to. On the Titanic, the waiter in the restaurant, he certainly is responsible for doing his waiting job in a good way. But if he sees an iceberg, he should know that he is responsible related to the safety of the, sa of the whole enterprise and needs to do something. And in my company, I always say, certainly you have the, the area where you are responsible for, but each, of, but each of, us, of us is responsible related to our culture and what we try to do in the field. And if you see something that is not compatible with this, you are obliged to talk with others about that. Using responsibility as a bridge to my understanding of team. Uh, we have also a very traditional understanding usually of team, uh, team coaching or, or team development. Uh, it's easy to get a, a job as a team developer, but most of the time you should ask back what is the question you want to solve and does it make sense that everybody of this department is on the workshop? Yeah. So, team is not those who sit together on one floor. Team is, in our notion, those who share responsibility. It's also, also an economic question. Do I use the energy of people who cannot contribute to the focus right now? And usually we should not. And we have some ideological ideas that everybody should be involved. If we involve everybody, then everybody is informed and they will find some ideas what, how they can develop this thing together. This is not my attitude. Usually I say let's bring together key figures for the core process, for the unsolved question key figures, and this is usually defined through qualification and organizational role. And let's, it's, it's problematic enough to have them to share reality and find out. And only if they know what play should be played, they can uh, invite other players on the stage and tell them how to play. And if there are too many players on the stage without being prepared what to play, it usually gives a group dynamic and then you can endless work on group dynamic. For me, team, develop, team culture development replaces group dynamic. M very often I, I am told uh, these are too many people. And I've uh, written down here, uh, drawn here uh, an organization to show you that if you are 
select through your focus what is the question to be answered, what is the responsibility, responsibility, then we can define who do we need now to develop the answers and who are the key figures who have the power, have the resources, who know what to do and so on. And, uh, if they are, and these are not all from one floor. This might, might be one who is managing the thing very well and another person who is complaining it's not possible to do so. So, then we have uh, two po polar representatives and they are invited. And their boss, what is he doing when they, uh, they have a discussion whether it's possible or not? And this boss has a colleague and so on. And then you can, uh, if you orient it to your focus, what the question to be solved is, you can define people from very different areas in the organization and still not having too many people in the workshop. You can do team development as a setting, also it's organizational development as a focus. Teams, those who share responsibility. And this makes very clear that you cannot define team without defining your focus. It's, it's a mutual definition process. If there is a, a discussion and you come to the conclusion that it's a problem of people are overworking and their nerves are down and they, are, uh, they, they fight with each other because no, nobody is uh, centered and quiet enough uh, to have a good discussion. Then say, okay, if this is a problem, who do we need then to have in the workshop to find out how people can relax? Uh, in what Geschwindigkeit? Uh, what uh, heißt Geschwindigkeit? Speed. Speed. In what speed should be uh, further the process and so on? Uh, and then you may have very different people uh, on the team workshop, as if you say no, it's a question of uh, insufficiently being supported by IT technology. Yeah. If this is the case you need, uh, the team is totally different. And this might not only be then people of your own organization, it's a, it might also be the supplier from other organizations who can be included because for, for this definition of the problem they are needed as key players. So, it's, uh, and this usually means that you cannot accept uh, uh, to be ordered if, if a team process is ordered and everybody is coming who is sitting on that floor. You need some kind of protagonist who says, I see a problem and then you should ask this person what from your perspective is the problem and who sh if we should uh, develop a play to solve this problem on the stage whom do we need, uh, who is most important, with whom do we start if there are too many, to find out whether this is the right notion for the problem. And maybe, and this also has consequences for the setting. Then you do not accept a three-day workshop because it might be that after three hours you find out the problem should be dif uh, defined differently but you do not have the people there. Then you can change the focus to work on something, you can work with the people who are here, but this is my, might not be the most important focus. So this has also consequences on the flexibility you organize your work within companies, and this usually means you do not take people outside in a hotel, but you go into the company, and you have a two-hour session, find out whether the hi hi first hypothesis, what the focus is, and whom do you, do you need to solve it, is right or not, and then take consequences to change the team or change the focus or both. And for that usually you need a responsible protagonist on the side of the company who helps you to organize that. 
And if you don't find anybody who takes responsibility within the company who is powerful enough, the chances that you can do good work is not very good. You can, then you can do something. You always can do something. Why not? <laughs> so, as we have learned for, again from the shifts, uh, symbiosis uh, is the non appropriate dealing with responsibility. So, relationships within those responsibilities not taken or responsibility is shifted to somebody, for example, who does not have the organizational role. Very often, uh, people from the company try to shift the responsibility for solving a problem to the consultant, but the consultant doesn't have the role. Sometimes, because the consultants feel um, stroked, uh, having so much power, and might accept that, then the other, the, the uh, responsible person from within the company says, I'm only human being and one of the team and be with us and now I'm not a boss. And then you have uh, what we call um, oh, a, a double symbiosis. So it's a compensation business. You do not take your leader role, and I do not take my consultant role. And we forgive each other. <laughs> <laughs> and usually it's not so easy to start a, re a, a responsibility dialogue from the beginning because people feel discomfort and need some help to translate this in the question of what is, a, what is, is this in terms of responsibility? When I feel discomfortable, does this have to do something with somebody is not, uh, I have ideas about questions that should be answers, and somebody who should help to answer these questions is not doing this, and I am trying to do this instead. Uh, maybe I do it because I feel responsible for the whole or because I love to have a powerful role which is not my organizational role or whatever. So it starts, very often starts with discomfort and then we need a procedure to uh, translate this in terms of responsibility and now when we have these, these other pictures uh, categories to ask questions. Is somebody, is everybody competent to do so? Are people equipped from the organization to do so? And so on. And what transactional analysis really can do is train people in communication to invite others into responsibility. And this is an important and difficult field. But you cannot do it in the way of uh, I know what is the reality and I confront you on your pathology. This is not appropriate to the organizational field. You need other attitudes and other communication figures. We developed uh, a small internet program for people who want to start this training and, and begin to understand how discomfort can be translated into questions of responsibility. Unfortunately, we did not, I developed this 15 years ago or so, and we did not yet find somebody who is, who is ready to develop that further. If, if I find a developer talent, this person will be famous and rich. <laughs> it can be you. <laughs> but be prepared to wait 20 years for an award. <laughs> yeah. So dysfunctional symbiosis is also uh, a system within potentials for better responsibility are not activated or not developed. Or on the other side of the same notion, this means uh, it's, it's wonderful if you can specifically help in clarifying responsibility, but it's better if you use this as an example how people can clarify responsibility amongst themselves alone, build up a dialogue 
culture of responsibility. And this is a concept uh, representatives of companies immediately understand that this is a valuable concept. And it's not very difficult to, to get a contract for that. And you can go even further and say you can look at organizations as a system of complementary responsibilities. Organization is nothing defined for the architect who is building up uh, the plant. Organization is something very different than for the finance people who want to finance the system. And it's very different the company for those who do the recruiting. So a company is not a thing, it's a perspective. How do you look at it, at the system? And I think it's a good idea to look at organizations as a system of complementary responsibilities. And if you find a lot of good procedures to clarify responsibilities, it has a lot of good consequences on structures and procedures. Yeah, I do not need to explain the other points on that. Before I go into that, is that okay? We do a short guided imagery, and then we do have a break, and then go on with that. Okay. How long do you do it? Uh, Fifteen minutes, or how long do you need? I do not have experience here. Fifteen minutes is fine. Oh, okay. So, you do not need pens for the guided imagery. And many of you know already what to do because everybody has his own, her own system to tune into inner realities. Very often, combined with getting more in touch with body sensations. You may feel how you sit. You may experience your breath. You may notice that my voice is lowering and going more slowly. And trance is only a word. It's standing for many experiences. And each of you has his or her very unique way to go into trance. And usually, if you are considering to do so, former experiences are popping up maybe when you were sitting at a fireplace, looking into the flames. You may have had a strenuous day, but now you can relax. And there are other fellows sitting around you. You might not knows him personally a lot, but she also are sitting there and looking into the flames. But somebody else might sit at a beach and listening to the waves coming over and over again. Or at a river, seeing the sunlight dancing on the waves at the surface. And you might hear one, some of the noises outside, and it's okay that the world is still going on. But you can take a break for yourself. 
and I don't know what experiences you have in your life that might have been activated to what Bernd Schmidt said in the last hour. Maybe you have not been aware of anything, but you can now look on your professional and organizational stages what business life, what professional life is going on there these days in what place are you involved usually what roles do you take or somehow slip in Is it the right stage for you? Do the roles fit for you? And who else is on this stage? And is somebody directing the development of the play? What style of directing do you watch? Is this style of developing the play a good style for you? And there's always somebody outside making some noise. Yes, why not? And you might not have direct answers or pictures in your mind. And maybe on the backstage, while this workshop is going on, one or the other experiencing is popping up and maybe called by one of the terms or concepts or pictures. Or you pick some, something up that you might not immediately find evident, but somehow it catches you. I don't know whether there are feelings, words, pictures, body reactions or whatever. that came up. It might be enough for you to become aware. But you might also be willing to talk to one of the other participants now in the break that is coming. And when you will come back from this break in time, You can sit there and more pictures and experiences from backstages can come up, accompanying your listening to the concepts. And you may notice that I lift my voice a bit, and <laughs> speed up a bit. This is what is called analog marking, helping you to turn into outside awareness enough to have a good break, but stay in contact with your experience enough to stay aware or even dialogue with us or on it. And at this point, you are released into the break and we will start here again uh, at
at, at 3.35, I will start. I'm late myself, I'm sorry. We had a little technical problem, but we solved it. Uh, I also apologize for my English. It's not very good today because I'm, I'm not into it. Usually when I work in foreign countries, I, I will be there two or three days in advance so that my brain understands to switch into the English and so sometimes the words do not come to my mind. Yeah. I'm not going into leading you into trance again right now. <laughs> but you are entitled to activate these parts of your personality in the background. Sharing learning and competence. I would find it wonderful if uh, TA people would understand themselves mainly as specialists for learning. And I will give you a, a number of uh, mental models how we understand learning and how we describe it. In our times, we are overstressing individuals. Individuals are trained, should learn something, go back into their organization and, and transfer it. But if you come out of a choir who sings traditional songs and you are in a workshop and everybody learns the new songs, you, you are not the best singer in the world, but you learn them. But when you go back to the old choir and nobody else knows the songs, you will lose immediately what you learned. And that's the situation of most of the people who come to seminars. And our economy spends billions of dollars for this kind of learning. So we should really think about that. Under the keyword systems learning, I will give you some ideas how we approach that problem differently. Many years ago, uh, so this is the first sentence, compensating an organization's lack of maturity with the engagement of individual players has limits and is exhausted. And if you have people in your training group, training groups and self-experience groups who are exhausted, that it might have to do with that they feel as individual over-responsible and do not understand that they need to invest energy to confront the system with their part contribu uh, uh, contribution to responsibility. I know it's not easy if you do not have a powerful role in the organization and this is for what you need in uh, symbiosis, confrontation, communication training. That you don't say, ah, but I have learned that you should do this and that. People will not like this, but you say, I would like to do good work. And this is what, I, what my ingredients are. But we are playing together and I need other contributions as well. And I, I invite you and, and I hope that you do something, your boss for example, uh, to activate this other contribution because only together we can do it. And uh, I really, if you give me a command that I should do this or that, I can do it. But I do not believe that this is a, a benefit for the company. If you tell me this, anyway you have the power to do so. But this and this behavior and this and this contribution would, could be an alternative that really has a chance uh, of more, for more performance. Very often uh, this communication went wrong. 
And if you do not find the right tone, your boss is angry about your tone and avoids to deal with your content. So it's very important to learn the right communication figures for that. So what we at least do if we have individual qualification or per people qualification, we focus not so much on their personal potency, but on the logic of their role in the system and what they can do to invite others and themselves to run the system better. So we call that system, system intelligent person qualification. And on the other hand, if we have the chance, and otherwise we, we would not work, to have a responsible person on the side of the company, we invite them to qualify structures and procedures in a way that these people which are, who are present can perform better. We call this person-sensible systems qualification. And very often consulting companies come in and inv invent a play that cannot be played with the people that are there. And they give the script for this play uh, to the customer and then they go away. And then it lies there. Very often for a long, long, fruitless time. So if a system wants really to develop in the direction of shared creation, we need a people qualification that is oriented to the functioning of the system. And this means that the educator must understand the system for what he or she is training people. And we need a consulting procedure and organization development process that helps the company to understand what steps they can do to develop, which can be done by the internals who are there or can be hired if available. But if this differs too much, the chances anything comes out is very low. And certainly, um, you cannot do this uh, by preparing and doing learning first and doing later. And most of you, I guess, will do anyway supervision-oriented learning work. Always using cases and real professional situation to develop. What we, 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 we certainly we teach concepts like uh, the four dimensions of responsibility and so on. But we only do this very briefly in seminar. And half of the time, we work with people on their cases. And we have uh, developed a system that they learn how to teach each other. Because our teachers are not familiar with all fields. We have all fields of companies at our institute. But, and our teachers teach them how to learn from each other and build up together a learning system and teach them how to direct their own learning process and gives them tools, settings, uh, approaches, and we build them up in a way that they can use them uh, and uh, multiply them in their own organization. Otherwise, uh, it will not go far because you cannot hire always an expensive external educator or consulting consultant for everything. This is why we have also to change our understanding of competence. Professional competence, content and context-oriented means. Role competence, does somebody, for example, know the basics of leadership? Does somebody know the role to be a leader in principle? Have any self-understanding tools, procedures, how he or she is organizing herself. In the theater metaphor, what I will explain later, 
This is an uh, actor school. You learn to be king. And you need really to uh, adopt some, um, some emotions, experiences, attitudes to play king. This is role competence. And when you never try to play king, you know too little of the role to play somewhere king. This is role competence. But king in a fairy tale is something else than king in a Shakespeare drama. And you can only, and if you in principle, in principle know how to play king, uh, it will not help you to play a good king in a Shakespeare drama unless you understand the logic of the drama. And this is what we call content, context competence. You need to know how the system you are, that you are trying to run with others together has its logic, how it, how it is working. And it's a, a multiplication between role competence and context competence. It doesn't help you if you uh, get better and better in role competence and get more training and more training in all communication types and styles and so on and you're working in a company and do not understand how the play is going there. And you as a teacher should tell somebody, uh, maybe you do not know any, any, all aspects of the roles you want to play, but what is lacking more is that you do not understand the play. And you need a different kind of education to get better. Because if you do not understand the play, it doesn't help if you enhance your qualities to play the role. And vice versa. Some people understand really how the system is working, but they never learn their role to be a leader. Then they need role training. And uh, is yes? Special um, context competence in every context. Like it's always different, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, certainly, context is different, and it's n nothing. Uh, um, nothing you can store as competence, but you must learn to self-diagnose yourself, understanding, okay, maybe I do not understand how the system is running, when you feel not competent enough. And then you go different ways, you do not go to your TA trainer and learn more about ego state, but you go to your colleagues and ask them how they understand how the game is working. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so this leads to different education strategies. And the third ingredient is matching. Um, roles should match for me and the context should match for me. And if the matching is not high, it doesn't help when I know the role and I know the context, but it doesn't make sense anymore to me. In my personal experience, it was uh, after I really uh, as an organizational consultant got better and better, I got worse because my soul was just not interested in going into companies and doing this work anymore. So the matching was lost between me as a person and my professional life and my career and the cultural logic of the uh, companies I worked for. And then I just gave up because the matching was lost. But sometimes the matching is also lost, not because of the person, but of because of the company. I had a supervision uh, of somebody who had, in one plant, was the boss of everybody, and he worked fine. In his inner images, I developed a methodology to analyze inner images. One, when is it right for me? And he was a kind of tribe chief. And whenever the situation was tribe chief-like, his soul felt at home and he did fine. <laughs> but then the, the company reorganized. And um, also he was uh, paid better uh, and got more power. Now he was responsible for one segment in many plants. And it got worse and worse. So the matching was lost from the organization development side. And they called me as a coach for him and I said, there's nothing to coach. 
<laughs> and he was lucky, half year later they changed back and he was good again. <laughs> and I could have pathologized him somehow, that, but it's just the matching was lost. And for me in person, uh, I, I never, uh, I, I learned to deal with bosses and to play social life with bosses, play important. I never had a big car, and so, because this is the kind of stages and plays was nothing for my soul. So I decided not to do that any work, of, although I learned as well as the roles as well and the context competence. But my soul got exhausted playing these roles, even if they were, have been paid very well. And so I decided that others in my company should play these roles. So it's important if you think about your competence really to find out which roles are you competent for, in which contexts, and is this matching? Is it matching from your side, but is it also matching from the side of the organization? So it's a different understanding of competence. It's including context and content. Besides categories of matchings, which can also be in uh, psychological categories. And this was a competence formula for individuals. And this second formula is competence formula for systems. Because in the end, it's important that the whole system gets competent. The bigger the company is, it doesn't help if some stars are very competent because they cannot do everything. So the system must become competent. And how does the system become competent? One is that uh, key players in the system uh, learn the same language, learn the same concepts, the same approaches, they know settings, they know to set up settings, they know the roles within learning settings. Everybody can play this game. And uh, very often, uh, Alumni of my institute say one of the big benefits of this system is when I meet in my company somebody who was also in Wiesloch at our institute, we recognize each other immediately and we know we can usually work hand in hand. And imagine we have companies who have sent off the last 15, 20 years 200 specialists to the training in our company. This really matters there, because you very often meet somebody who knows the logic of uh, learning together. So this is why it's important that the HR responsible people develop a strategy who in our company should learn which language, know which setting, which concepts, that when, we, when somebody saying let's make a responsibility check because I feel discomfort. Everybody in the room knows what they will do now. Then they really can talk about the responsibility on a content level. If the, the other, but if the other in the team, one has done gestalt training, the other has done classical organizational development training, they do not understand. So they meet they need most of the energy to find a way to clarify the language in which they might solve the content problem. And this is exhausting. Uh, and many companies think if they send their members somewhere, they bring the multitude, the variety of many schools, the richness into the house. No, they bring Babylonian confusion. <laughs> So, individuals must be competent, and this must be coordinated, so that they have chance, if they go sit together, that they have a shared learning culture. So that very quickly they can uh, focus on the content questions they have to learn about, and not use all the energy to organize themselves as a learning system with all the misunderstandings that are included. 
and it doesn't help if the individual individuals are well trained they need to practice with each other to learn together so it's a shared learning culture and it needs shared practice it's uh, also if everybody is prepared well they need to sh to practice it together if if you uh, uh, build the orchestra everybody should know to play his instrument or her instrument but when they come together they have really to drain uh, to play together to have a shared presentation culture and this, the whole thing has to match to the kind of business to the economic areas they are working for and to the logic of the old organizational development processes this is why in the long run the HR strategy and the OD strategy should be linked. I will say uh, more about this later. So this is the systems formula. And if a system is not competent, then you have a diagnostic category. Is it because individuals are not competent? Or is it that they are competent, but it's not coordinated? Nobody knows who knows what and can play which roles? Or is it, in principle, they are quite mature at that point, but they never uh, practice to, to activate this together as an interplay? So, like in a football uh, team, uh, a soccer team, they need some time to learn to bring their individual competence to a um, company competence together. And this leads me to a new keyword that I'm, we have just written some new uh, articles on systems learning. So we say, you should, if you learn, you should lo learn within the roles you play in the company. If you, if you come as an IT, special, if you are, uh, IT specialist and a provider for IT services, when you learn together with others, you do it within that role and not as a human being in general. And as I said before, uh, with the role concept, Certainly your uniqueness as human being should be there, but within the role as an IT specialist, not besides it. And the, the boss should serve, the leader should certainly learn as a leader. And she is, he is required or she is required uh, really to show leadership behavior within the group and not colloquial behavior. And as you heard, you heard it before, uh, learning and working goes together. So do not do any education things like mountain climbing and, uh, and fire walking and whatever. This gives a good, sometimes a good group dynamic effect. But if you are back home, the chance that you transfer it into cooperation within your organizational role is very low. But still, a lot of money is spent for these kind of adventures. I personally, I, I will not say never, but us, usually uh, it should, uh, you should activate a learning along the type of work you do together. But do it as examples, not to work together. And important in the end is learning in the everyday life. What I said before, you can name also team learning. Those who are responsible together should learn together. For example, leadership training should be leadership relationship training. Leader and his subordinate come together because they're really also it's a leadership relationship. It's unique because of their roles, of their personalities, and of the co 
organizational context they are in. Why shouldn't they learn together? Because there is not the right leadership relationship. It's only a working leadership relationship. And these relationships are as different as people are. So why not train a minimum of not a person in leadership, but a leadership relationship as an example for learning how to deal with leadership. And the competence is needed from both sides. It's not a question only of the leadership. Uh, when I learned jumping with horse jumping, when I was a young man, uh, I was a beginner, but the horse wa was a beginner also. <laughs> and this was horrible. <laughs> then I, I, I was borrowed a horse that was not a beginner. And I learned, learned quite quickly. And I thought, oh, now I'm a good horse rider in jumping. But then I got back on the horse that was not trained. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like leading uh, a member of your organization who is not trained. And certainly, the everybody has to be trained within the role, directed to the relationships of roles. And, uh, Individual training that is neglecting these relationships, I don't believe they are very efficient. <coughs> and what I also mentioned, the further we come, the more I repeat myself, because from any different angle, some of the principles are the same, certainly. For example, the multiplication of learning. Uh, we do not use as core methods in training people, any methods or concepts, these pe the people cannot use themselves in their company for directing learning processes. So we do a lot of collegial learning, uh, and these members do not only learn uh, focused on their question, they learn on taking all the roles in the learning system and they learn to direct collegial learning. And then from our company, we offer them all the instruments. Uh, this is why we invest a lot of money um, to put that uh, as shared, um, hi, uh, to be shared that say if they want, for example, uh, do a collegial supervision, they go on, uh, to our website, then they go through the charts uh, to the topic learning together, and then they remember, oh yeah, this was, this was a setting I found so nice. Then they click on the chart, then the system automatically leaves, leads them to the video at this point, they get the explanation again. And if they want to do this exercise, then they have a toolbox. They click on the toolbox, it opens, and they have the exercise they know already that have been explained. Uh, they go, went through early, and they can print with their own name at the top the exercise and the information paper and the design. And then they can use this to work with their working group. And even not very well-trained people can do a lot of very qualified work equipped like this. They do not, because it's not all their personality that should carry the learning process. They can use the whole culture and the instruments to repeat that and multiply that culture. And this meets, this, and if you want to train uh, enhance a system qualification of a system, then you should not only qualify specific individuals, but you have to qualify the whole system. And in terms of money, you have to invest, for example, in building up such kind of tools and teach people, instead of doing one more supervision, teach people how they can use the tools they already know to set a learning uh, setting up for others and get supervision for that. Also, this is not their primary role description. But the whole, for the whole system, this is a better effect. And the company uh, 
might be more convinced that it's worthwhile to pay them to be a member of your training groups. But they see, they do something with it. And certainly, um, the learning culture should not, should something to do, ha have something to do with performance. The question, for what am I in the company? For what am I paid? Is it possible to deliver that? And sometimes, um, I have the impression that uh, education procedures help people to find themselves, if it works, somewhere, but not as a performer in a company. And why should then the company support that? When people only come back and are more selfish, maybe more self-aware, but also more selfish, and do not understand what the whole system needs to learn to get better. But certainly an individual cannot do this. Uh, HR department and OD responsible agency sh should share, should have a shared concept to frame that. Otherwise, individuals would be overburdened with this responsibility. The theater metaphor. I already used it uh, talking to you during the guided imagery, during my speech. And I guess nobody had any problems adopting this kind of language because the theater metaphor uh, is usually, in our culture here at least, um, in, in good match with an understanding of these roles. I can directly use this, uh, these roles. For some time, we tried to do really actors and theater training with a the theater specialist uh, in our professional training groups, but this has turned out to be too complicated. So we only use the theater metaphor as a metaphor. You can use the theater metaphor to indicate to your personality. So which are my roles in life? Which are the stages I enter or I am drawn in? Which are the topics, the themes? What kind of stories? And which styles of play? And if somebody is not satisfying, which dimension is it? Sometimes people come to our training, to our training groups and they want to learn uh, new roles uh, that they have access to new stages. And I tell them we have unhappy psychotherapists enough. <laughs> so it's maybe not the st role and it's not the stage, but it's the kinds of stories you are, uh, you are uh, accepting to be a part of. Or the styles of play. Yes? There are people who are wonderful in this on small stages, on experimental stages. And, but the same people are maybe not very good for big stages. And, and vice versa. But they don't know what is wrong. And the theater metaphor helps you and the group that is mirroring you to tell you where they can see you and in what, which direction you can uh, develop further, that it's fitting. And now maybe one day you are now uh, in, a, in a smaller uh, department, more in the developmental part of the company, and suddenly you play your role as a leader wonderfully. Because you have less people, you have different stories to support by your leadership role and so on. And you thought you are wrong and need now to be a consultant instead of a leader. And this is a personality model that is non-psychological. In order to give each other feedback and ideas how you can learn and develop in these dimensions, 
you do, do not need any classical psychological concept. So this is a kind of self-experience and mirroring within companies people adopt easily and they give really intimate feedback to each other because they do not feel it's like uh, becoming too private. It's becoming essential, but not private. And this is why it is easy to adopt and spread. There's a picture that serves the idea personality in the light of the stages. And you can think about what are, maybe in the guided imagery, one of the other stages came to your mind. How, how, what, what would happen if you would play the same things but on a very different stage? What, how sh should this stage be that it fits your soul? You can fill it in because somehow maybe in your childhood you have been grown up with it. The influence, I don't know, maybe I, I do not have a chart for that, so I say now, the, the influence of milieu in which you are grown up is absolutely important. And to develop into milieus that you are not familiar with or develop competence to move in new milieus is, is exhausting. And you have to find out how, how far from your um, heritage milieus you can move and still feel to be yourself and easily working from your soul, from, from, your, from your inner core. And very often it's a, a change of style necessary, not so much a change of roles. You can also, and this is a, um, the way we concept almost all concepts, you can use it to describe individuality as well as systems. And you can use this here, the met metaphor, for example, uh, for merger processes. So which are the stories of the two companies that everybody feels connected with? On which stages do they try to be important? Who has what kind of roles and how are the roles configured in, in the different organizations? And what are the styles? And then certainly we do not have answers but it makes it more adult to talk about further shared place if we subdivide this in this kind of perspectives. And people then can easily talk to each other. You have to develop questions, what to ask in order to ask for styles, for example. And very often, to give typical examples makes you understand also you cannot explain it very logically. So you, as you can, you can easily see that this is a differentiated way to deal with the cultural encounter communication model combined with the theater metaphor. And these are all ingredients for a didactic system people can use for themselves and easily transfer into their organization because these people do not need an extra psychological training to work with these dimensions, not necessary. So this was communication. <coughs> now I want to say something about another concept I developed 30 years ago, or even longer. Uh, I received, I was a, you see I was a bit younger, I guess it was 1986 or so, I received the first IATA award for scientific work for this dilemma concept. Mm -hmm. And here you see two of the articles and here a video where this is explained. And when I was with Rosemary in Oxford, uh, uh, some of the um, 
videos are from our workshops there. And I also did uh, examples in consulting with this dilemma concept. You, you can, especially in the Oxford videos, see uh, if you want to see me work, you can see it on videos there. It's called conversations there. Unfortunately, it's not defined which concepts are in which conversations. You have to find out. This was too much, too much work for us. But if you want to see me work, and this is very different from see me talking here, then you have these options. A dilemma. Uh, I developed it from the starting from the corner game. In TA, you have the corner game when you feel cornered. Uh, and I combined it with, combined it with Bates and uh, schizophrenia theory somehow. And this came out. It's not a logical outcome. It is an outcome uh, when I tried somehow to, to understand what you can do when people felt caught and struggle without any sh hope on solution. A dilemma, I start. Uh, on the content level, logically, is the situation. No, first is how you feel. You feel caught. And if you could analyze the dilemma, you would find out that no option within the solution logic would satisfy you or would be really an option you could choose. Whatever you try to solve the problem leads to stay stuck or even get more stuck in the problem. And usually you would get frozen if that's the case. And for example, uh, this is it's now the process of consulting. When, when I um, am in a learning conversation with somebody and this person offers himself as uh, I'm very practical, you can talk to me about everything, I'm open to everything. And I, first I believe it. And after some time I find everything we do on this level that is easily possible with this person will not lead anywhere. And I feel like I should go somewhere deeper or elsewhere or, or have a different focus. But I do, not, I do not know where to go. I only feel like this. But I detect myself being struggling. This means being very active, but when I ask myself in my stomach, do I have hope to come somewhere like this, the answer will be no. And then I know I'm some kind in a dilemma. This means in a situation, if it would be analyzed, have a logic of equations that do not lead to, super, uh, to solutions. The premises have to be discussed anew. We should not go deeper somewhere, so we should step back. That what is this, in what kind of situations are we? That a solution is not possible. And certainly the impossibility might only be in the frame of reference of my client. I do not understand why it's not possible. And I think this person is stubborn or resistant. And, and then I get angry because my wonderful intervention do not work. And I, I'm becoming, I'm shifting anger to my client. And this is, uh, instead of saying something must uh, be there, that as what seems to be a solution for me is not a solution for you. Let's step back together. And this is for what we need an equal eye level contract. If we are already stuck in a fight and we have not prepared an equal eye level contract, before, then it's difficult to get back. This is why I always start with this uh, building up this equal eye level relationship. Yeah, and then you can try to find out why, sir, you have ideas why this situation is not solvable. But uh, sometimes it's very difficult because you don't have a, a on a content level, you do not understand why it's unsolvable. I cannot explain this and give you examples right now, but 
what I identified now are four stages of experience that you can identify. It gives you indications, uh, uh, analytical uh, um, indications that you are in a dilemma. Also, you do not understand in what kind of. And there are four stages. One is avoiding. You, you go to a, a different topic where it's working better. But then the topic in which the logic of dilemma is embedded is just avoided. And when you go back to the dilemma, for example, spousing, uh, when you go back to this topic, the dilemma wakes up again. And then you try to do something about it, but you struggle. This is activity without meaning and reliance. You do not feel you will come anywhere there. And in between, you give up, you get exhausted, and then you recover a bit and you go back, but the logic is not changed and this is why you go on struggling. And the only thing what you as a consultant should do and invite, and I've described how you, what, what the ingredients of relationship management should be that this works, um, is invite the person with the idea of despair. Despair is a qualification. It might be wild despair or mild despair, but you feel like, oh, we are not getting anywhere this way. We should not put more energy as long as we do not have other ideas how to approach the problem. So at least you protect yourself and your client. But very often to, to teach this to your client also leads into a dilemma because the client understands this like you abandon him. And then the client invites you to go back into struggling. But if you go back into struggling, you're back in the dilemma circle and you are, have no chance to detect the dilemma from outside. So this needs a lot of uh, delicate procedures and they are described in the different articles and videos on that. Uh, it's one of the concepts you will rarely find elsewhere. So I really invite you to study this concept. But it's, it's difficult. So I jump into a next topic. Uh, I did not say now anything about what is systemic. Also, I'm uh, called the uh, how, how you say the inventor or the, promo the first promoter of systemic GA, <coughs> at least on the German-speaking website. What is the systemic approach? First, I say something about the systemic approach without TA. I also said something what, what my understanding of TA is getting better in sharing reality and developing co-creative reality. The systemic perspective was coming from other roots than TA. Biological, I also uh, said Bateson, uh, physics, and we have in Germany now uh, systemic Gesellschaft, Association for Systemic Approach, that is much bigger, for example, as TA. And Systemic Approach has a chance to be accepted uh, for psychotherapy, for um, public financiation, beside behavior therapy and psychoanalysis now. So it's an important development. It also had this childhood developmental problems. What is systemic? What is systemic? When, uh, when I first said I'm working systemic, as a systemic consultant, I often got the answers, I also work with systems. I have families and couples. But working with systems is not systemic. Systemic means uh, some perspectives, how you approach living systems. You may also work with systems, certainly. Also with families, companies. But systemic is an adjective, it's not a thing, the system. 
So, and one is that you, uh, what I said with this uh, notion of Bateson, with the, with the dog and the football, that your basic idea is that uh, you have to deal with living systems which have a logic you never will completely know how it works. And you look for a pattern of interrelatedness. So metaphor is a mobile. Yeah. And certainly there are parts in the mobile when you uh, do something at a specific input point, it will just count, be counterbalanced and the system stays how it are how it was. And there are sometimes other points when you touch the systems there, they will be start moving and it will even uh, accel accelerate these movings. So the, the, the perspective of interrelatedness and patterns of interrelatedness. The third is reality of constructive per perspective. Reality is always the reality of an observer. So never try to describe reality without thinking about who is, uh, whose reality is that and what is the reality of this person who is describing the reality. What are the interests? So always the context is important. And certainly all reality, that is civilization, reality is a product of human thinking about reality. Even if it's built out of brick like this building here. There was an idea. And certainly uh, because we are communicators, we think about can we influence somebody by communication if we do not like this kind of reality built out of bricks. And maybe it will have, a, um, it will need 50 years or 100 years to change that. But it's changeable by communication because all reality, civilization reality is a broad, a bro product of human uh, imagination. There are some of the attitudes, uh, not pathological, but resource and solution oriented, curiosity. It's experimental, we can just try something and find out whether it works or not. We do not have an explanation how it was the situation was developed. We can also think about how can we change the situation, although we do not understand the situation. It's experimental. My colleague, family famous family therapist with whom I had a family therapy institute for many years, he always said, you do not need to understand how you got the car in the mud in order to think about how to get it out, how to get it out. These are two kind, different kinds of questions. And the systemic questions are usually those how to get it out. There are, and there are also fashions, what is more in the foreground and the background. For me, very important is the systemic perspective in learning culture, what I also explained to you as systemic learn, system, systems learning. Because I really firmly believe that we need new educational systems that we have a chance to overcome old habitual patterns in organizations by learning. It's not, cannot be done by individual training. But a lot has to be changed on our provider side. Mentally, structurally, profit model, all these things. M much has to be changed. Uh, I'm also uh, was uh, or am honorary president of an organizational coaching association. I also said already goodbye to this association. <laughs> uh, but I've written and, uh, uh, and presented a lot on coaching. What is organizational coaching? Because it's, it has really, it's 
own rules and it's not just individual coaching in the framework of organizations. That's something different. If you want to read more on that, I've written a lot. Is coaching our own profession? We have a long discussion that if something, if, if a activity has a chance to become a profession, it must address a basic relationship between human beings and, and the world. So, human and health is all the professions in the medicine. Human and law, all the professions uh, in the law system. And for me, if coaching should have a chance to be a profession on its own, uh, it has a relationship human and professional life and human and organizational life. And I think these are essential relationships. And the same as in TA or psychotherapy or else, whether you are a coach or not is not defined by setting, by typical clients, by typical problems you try to solve. For me, it's the perspectives, and this is also organizational perspectives, to take them really serious, and not only individual perspectives in organizations. And you are a good coach if you are expert on that, not if you have the uh, usual role of a four-eye consulting situation. You can be a good coach because you have, uh, you bring your professional perspectives into the organization, human being and organization, being a leader. Being a specialist of, of any kind, it's a perspective coaching. It's not so much a specific role. And this is why you have to define your services and your expertise by the challenges of the organizational field. And now we are back to the question, you should know something about the field. Otherwise you do not have a chance really to be a good contributor there. And coaching as really caring for the relationship human being and organization or human being and profession uh, is a program, not only an individual competence. It's a program for an organization, it's a program for an association. And certainly, if you want to good, be a good coach for profession questions, you need to understand the professional market and have an idea where it develops, how occupation situation will be in the future for certain certification levels and so on. It's not, it cannot be done by only sitting beside your client and help him to explore because it's also knowledge we need and ideas to come to judgment. So coaches are at least Descartes-led, Descartes-led. So psychology may be one of the disciplines. So, and this was uh, what is a systemic perspective for me? And systemic TA then is helping individuals and systems to get better in sharing reality and co-creating reality by the perspectives, by the systemic perspectives. I have to stop at five? Five thirty. Five thirty. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> it, it looks at, as if I had a chance, a chance to get through. Are you already exhausted? No? Yeah? Sure, a bit. How many slides you got? Pardon? How many slides you got? Um, I guess... About 20. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, I've developed a lot of more concepts or ideas that I find together give a system. Uh, and you certainly have to decide at each point where you are working what of these ideas you want to adopt and tie together to your working system right now because you certainly cannot do everything at every time. One of the concepts I have developed is changing identity beliefs. Is that okay to see, that I tell the example, your example? Yeah. So this is Giesen, Anandan Giesen from, from Chennai, and he has been uh, at the seminars in Oxford, and for years we have worked and developed things together, and we will next year have our own curriculum, international curriculum. And he's, he's a clinical, transactional analyst, and still is. And he learned a lot about organizational consulting. But we, we Skyped very often, and some day he said, see, also, I really understand your concept, uh, and I know what to do. I do not feel as an organizational consultant. Uh, so the competence and the possibility to do something is not automatically changing identity beliefs, felt identity beliefs. And what I did with him is uh, an approach I call identity card reorganization. Passamtsarbeit auf Deutsch. <laughs> Pass am Arbeit, yeah. From pass uh, is identity card. In English, it's better. <laughs> and I, I invited him to, to pass his identity card to me by Skype. It works also by Skype. And I said, oh, he is written uh, entrepreneur. He once was an entrepreneur. And he is written psychotherapist and teacher for psychotherapists, clinical TA but he has not read it, I am an organizational consultant. And I said, okay, do you know that I'm an authority concerning organizational consultancy? And now I write in your identity card, he is also an organizational consultant, and I put a sign on it and I gave it back to him. And you might not believe it, but it might change a lot because now it's a reorganization of belief system and what helps him is that he does not be sure that he is it now, but he knows he is whether he believes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and this changes a lot. And also in clinical application, for example, uh, I had often the problem, somebody thought about himself uh, said uh, he is a nasty guy, for example. And this was an identity belief. I am nasty, not I behave from time to time nasty and in specific context uh, I'm irritated and I act nasty. No, I am nasty. And then he tried to be nice, said no, but that people do not recognize that he is nasty. And then he's so nice that he denies many aspects of his reality that from time to time he gets an angry attack and really gets nasty. And no matter whether he gets nasty or he's nice, he's only nice to cover that he is in reality nasty. And, uh, and you can do endless emotional and 
biographical work on a person that is, uh, that is not changing his or her identity belief through experiences and behavioral change. You need to have to redefine identity. And in religions, this is called Segen, blessing. And it's, a, it's an important interaction with someone or a group, an institution, that is felt that they can define who I am. This is changing identity beliefs. And it's interesting, sometimes people say, oh, why, what is different now? Let's say it's an angry guy, it's a nasty guy. I say, um, we redefined you, you are a critical person, not a nasty guy. And now you can, because over years you learned to behave nasty or nice, you will not change that from today up to tomorrow. But it's no longer a proof that you are nasty, it's only a proof that you learned a habit. And you will, because you are somebody different now, critical person, will after, uh, from time to time learn to, to remember what happens anyway under a new label and develop new habits. And this is on a definition level. And it's important to differentiate definition levels of this kind and belief system levels from behavioral and experience change levels. Uh, Gieson and me, we wrote a book on that, with this wonderful picture. Uh, we have it free as a, a PDF. It's also in the material, if you are interested in learning more about this process, the journey of a caterpillar, uh, the change from clinical to organizational orientation. Something I, was also I want also to direct your attention to is uh, the counter dynamics to drivers. I don't know which one it was, but one day I suddenly said, oh, I have a sixth driver. <laughs> and, uh, but when I thought more about it, I said, no, it's not a sixth driver. I did never found a sixth driver. The five drivers are wonderful. But it was a counter dynamic. Some, uh, and I defined counter dynamics to the drivers, which makes it difficult sometimes to diagnose a driver. Somebody who is on a be perfect driver might, as a, may, might develop as a defense against the be perfect, I don't care. And if you have somebody who addresses you in the defense, from the defense perspective, you certainly have the reaction to tell this person, but a bit perfection would not be bad for you. And then you are within the system supporting the be perfect driver. This is why you should identify the counter dynamic. This is not finished. I never put much more work into it. Maybe somebody of you wants to develop that further. And be strong. Sometimes people do not know, in order, for example, not to become violent, they go on the counter dynamics and you can do anything with me. I will not oppone against that. And then you can say, oh, don't be, so don't be such a, a weak person. You have to develop strength. And this would be a wrong intervention because you support the be strong dynamic that is the cause of the counter dynamic. Certainly, if, this, uh, if you work with, this, uh, with uh, drivers in the way I do it, you cannot only do it uh, technically by words, identifying words. What you can do, and I did this when I taught it, and we have, but only in German, I guess, videos for that, I talk to somebody out of the driver dynamic, and you, and you feel how what kind of atmosphere and reality is created between each other, what comes into the foreground, that people 
get the feeling to diagnose driver dynamics and not do it only technically by identifying specific words for the drivers. For me, that's too technical. So, please you, sometimes, please you people come along very nasty, better nasty than nobody. And if you tell them you can, why, why, why don't you try to be nice to people? Try hard can be avoiding the difficult to have a good way of trying hard by no matter, doesn't matter, easy going. And hurry, hurry up, sometimes go in the counter dynamic, let it be, and also freeze to be calm. A friend of mine who is a, a neuro specialist, has, he said, you can, I don't, yeah, I never checked it, whether it's true, but it's a good metaphor. You, uh, people uh, who are under stress, uh, as, there are some people who, if you have them in the clinic, that really learn to let go. But there are others who learn to get, to stay calm outside, but if you measure their brain waves, and their blood pressure and all these systems, they are still in the hurry up. For me, hurry up is be anxious not, not to be part of life. So I have to get more and anxiety to lose life, being vivid. So if you are interested, uh, I'm not sure whether I ever wrote it in English, but that's the essential of it. You can experiment with it, whether it gives any plausibility to you working with your clients and maybe you write something about it. Then there's a big part of my work that has to do with inner images and dream work. I've also read a book on dream work, on systemic dream work. And we use inner images and dream work as a, a method to build up a multi-layer communication culture, also within companies. You remember this picture with the um, dialogue model of communication? To do that. And <coughs> I developed also uh, specific guided images and, and questionnaires and a procedure to interview somebody to find out what his basic inner images are, maybe related to the professional work, or to the kind of stages she or he has to act on, or to the kind of roles, and so on. What makes sense to their soul or not? And this is starting with <coughs> question, when you were young, what was your idea, what you will be uh, uh, one time? What will your pr profession be? And then uh, assumed you became a carpenter. And there is a film about your life as a carpenter. And there is one picture uh, in front of the cinema showing a scene out of this movie. What can we see on this scene? And then I ask, who in your family is in, in your mind as a professional? As and then we do the same procedure like this, and then we get our pictures, and sometimes in absolutely uh, overwhelming and plausibility to see, oh yeah, all these pictures have ingredients that are some kind of the same. And this is where my soul is at home. And now I compare this with the role stages place of my professional life, and then I get an idea what to change there so that my soul is more at home at work. Doesn't mean big changes, maybe changes in stories, maybe changes in roles, maybe changes in place and, or in styles. Uh, this was on a TA conference, I guess it was in Vancouver. I did a guided imagery, I do guide, guided imagery, me today, me at former times and me in, in future, and then adopt an organization, how it is today, how it was, and where does it develop. You have now the, the matching 
question. Huh? And you have six, six pictures now in guided imagery. And then you come with these pictures and dialogue with others. And when you tell them how you relate to these six pictures, they mirror you what is plausible to them, what other pictures uh, come up within them, and they offer you these pictures. And so we have a lot of mirroring processes in our training groups. How important these inner images might be by di directing your life came from this example in Vancouver. It was a, a, a famous organizational colleague on the TA scene. I did the guided imagery. Uh, I was a child and my first uh, encounter was a helping process. And he was a management coach. And after the guided imagery, he came back and said, oh, it came to my mind, it's a story that is 60 years or 50 years ago, and I totally forgot it. My father was a medical doctor, the only one in the small town. And one day, the owner of the only plant in this town got crazy and ran around naked. And they did not have anybody else to ask my father, go there and somehow uh, help to catch this person and calm this person down without the person is losing his face because he is man, one of the honorary people of the town. And he said, I don't know how he did it, but my father did it. And now it comes to my mind, oh God, this is, is what I am doing also since 40 years. So, working with background images has a lot to do with professional empowerment that is coming from the core. And sometimes it has to be enriched. For example, the boss who had suffered from an authoritarian teacher and decided never to be authoritarian himself, but he never learned then to be a good, a powerful leader. And he needed to do work on these inner images to set his own empowerment free. Fanita English, I asked them once, what did you, what do you think, what, how would have um, GA developed further when Byrne did not have died? And she, she said, maybe in this uh, direction of Jungian psychology, working with symbols, with inner images, and things like that. So also I'm quite strict in the logic of working with systems and say let's be real otherwise we will not have an influence on our society. And in, there's a book of James Hillman, a Jungian. He has, the book is titled 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Still a Mess. <laughs> and I do not want that in 100 years we'll have written a book, 100 years of TA or coaching and the world is still a mess. <laughs> Let's develop something that we have really a significant influence, otherwise I guess mankind doesn't have a future. So professional intuition, I've also worked on professional intuition. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful book out, I also mentioned already mentioned it from Paul McConnick, McCormick, uh, uh, also uh, essays of Eric Byrne on intuition, primal images and intuition and all these things. Uh, I guess most of you know that TA developed out of studies on intuition of Eric Byrne. And Byrne, who was lifelong a psychoanalyst, uh, described, also he also uh, referred to Aristoteles, he described intuitive processes from a clinical pers perspective. That you, for example, learn intuitively to understand 
the developmental phase in which a problem uh, developed and things like that, so primal images. Uh, and he said, um, you will only will become really good as a professional if you learn to use your intuition and learn to train it. Intuition is nothing nat natural, it's cultural. And somebody who doesn't know anything cannot have a good intuition. It has to do with field competence, with all the things I've already talked about. So many of the discussion where is intuition located in the ego state and so that I don't think leads any further. <coughs> Eric Burns said uh, there is a limitation to development of intuition that you need to be a good professional and one of the limitations are taboos that you do not dare to be aware of emotions, um, motivations because of taboos uh, and yeah and the other uh, limitation to intuition is greed undetected emotions for example greed you are not aware of your own greed when you offer specific services to your patient you should be aware of that uh, there's an interesting discussion in German. There's a book out where I've also written two or three articles in with his old Eric Byrne articles to discuss all that. I, I don't think it's translated. I want, uh, I, what I did, and there, this is written in English, is enlarge the concept with the Jungian concept of intuition of the possible. Jung described that we have a function of our soul with which we have, we have somehow an intuitive idea what somebody could become. And have a valid idea what somebody could become is as important as understanding his history. Because the other soul understands that this person has an idea about me, what I can become, that is true. And this gives, a, this produces a, a, a bounding, uh, sometimes much more than emotional bounding, uh, according to classical empathy. These, uh, these interrelations are, in the last two, three years, discussed under the keyword resonance, which is much larger than the classical empathy. What I added to that is, uh, and for me it's maybe the, the biggest uh, limitation to intuition, that these are habits. We are just to use it, see things in this or that way. We do not even know that we have schemata with which we act. And so it's very important to be in dialogues in which uh, others offer us other perspectives to make us aware that we have habits and schemata with which we approach reality. And it's competence. Somebody who is, as I said, somebody who is not qualified for a specific role, a specific content, cannot have qualified intuitions for this role and for this content. He or she can have any intuitions, but it's not clear whether they are relevant for the uh, improvements a person needs to do. So also intuition has to be directed and qualified. This is why intuition training should be part of the multi-layer communication in educational systems. This is about I don't know, 20 years, 25 years or so. Uh, it's, uh, I guess it's still the same, the European TA exam. I don't know whether it's... Uh, in 1981, in the DGTH, a German TA 
associations. I was head of the training committee. And up to then, we only had classical content questions for examination. And we said we should do something different. And this means uh, also to have content questions, to play tapes, but also to present a case shows that I do understand the field and the context. Not only, up to then we only had these small parts of communications that showed that we could competently deal with transactions. And going along with developing this concept, what later was the IATA, became the IATA examination system, I developed this Toblerone model for supervision. Toblerone is because of the chocolate. This should be this white chocolate with this. Uh, and the profit, so to, to, to put some order to supervision processes. And uh, the question is, can I uh, conceptualize what I meet? There's a theory supervision, conceptualization supervision. And this is something different than, for example, am I clear about my, about my identity and role in the system? And this is something different as can I design a case, a project, from the beginning to the end, do I have a, um, maps how to organize a case or how to organize a project uh, in a company? And it, because usually in a supervision we only have a half or two third or three quarter of an hour to do the supervision. It, this schema could be helpful to build a contract or to come to a diagnosis. Say, what I think what you need is more uh, to work on adequate conceptualization because the way you are telling me what you are doing and what I see what you are doing from my frame of reference doesn't have to do anything with each other. So you, and you need to develop your way to think about what you do in a way that causes plausibility to others and if you work in teams that invites others to co-create with you on the way you, you see it. So for those of you who train and do supervision, this could be a schema to clarify what priority for the upcoming supervision you choose and whether this is the most useful. This is, uh, these are concepts now more going into company questions. I already explained that leadership. Uh, leading someone means successfully inviting him or her into performing within an enterprise or helping to create a new one. So last last part is more direction, strategic leadership. And if you, clo and I, what I already said is there's no right leadership, it's only functioning leadership. And in different contexts with different players, in the leadership relationships, different leadership styles are successful. So it doesn't make sense to define good leadership and train it. And usually leadership is a network of leaderships. And it's a hierarchical network of leaderships. And it's also a horizontal system of leaderships. So to qualify a system, it doesn't, it's, it's not enough only to look at one leadership relationship. It must be embedded in cooperation relationships of many kinds and in hierarchical systems. It's a chain and a chain is, is as strong as the weakest part of the chain. And usually the weakest part doesn't get the money to get supervision. 
So if you are invited to do leadership training, look at the whole chain and check whether this kind of training you are invited to do is the most important because it doesn't make sense to strengthen uh, one chain part that is not the weakest. So this is systemic, thinking systemically, not thinking individually, not thinking in attribution, but thinking in interrelated influences. And your leadership task is to integrate realities. This means that all the schemata we have discussed already could be instruments for you to help those which are in a leadership relationship with you to come to shared realities and come to shared creations of realities. This is why good leadership and good coaching or good consulting from the basic competencies is not so much different. But there are different roles, organizational roles, different business models, yes, but the competencies are quite similar and need to be similar so that they can work together as a learning system. Power. It's still the case that even in our Even in our groups, uh, where people come from companies, they have a distorted relationship to power. And we have a lot of fashion saying power is old style, hierarchical, is out, we need to have self-evolving uh, uh, systems and self-organizing system, systems, and we do not need hierarchical power. I think that's nonsense. Hierarchy is one of the oldest controlling principles in evolution. And it's absolute not absolutely necessary to have also hierarchical relationships in order to define priorities. Certainly what we do not need are, are stupid, violent hierarchies. But many of you may know in organizations the problem that the hierarchy is not organized and it's not doing their, their duty. And this is why others cannot, sometimes it works that others organize themselves in a quite satisfying way, but you cannot develop strategic projects that way. So it's important uh, for many people to develop a constructive, positive relationship also to hierarchical power. But this is power of sovereignty. But this is not uh, the only source of power. Power, meets to, uh, power means you have influence on somebody that he is co-constructing reality in a way you also find it good. And People give power to others. Uh, this is empowerment or authorization. And it's not, and uh, sometimes we follow somebody who is, has the power of, uh, as a creator, because this person is talented to design projects, to know what is necessary to come somewhere. And others understand that. And when they are constructive, they follow this person not because of the organizational hierarchical role, but of individual talents. And, this, and the third way of power is the power of sense or meaning making. This is, uh, there are some people who somehow can make meaning, attribute meaning to things. And we love somehow to follow them and orient ourselves with them. And these three, this is not a, 
not a power you can train in a skill training, certainly. This has, has something to do with, uh, with the way as human being and how you de develop yourself in life. But it's important that these ways of powers work together, do not compete with each other. We had just had a case of an institution where, they, because they have been too traditional, the bosses two levels uh, above, uh, hired a young specialist and told him, you, you, are, uh, you should uh, give a lot of input to develop our system. And they did not uh, deal with their boss and, she, and he felt that she wants to take his job. And she was angry that he blocked everything she wanted to pursue. And to make them clear that they, are two, they both have power, but they are different kind of powers. And see, she was not interested to have hierarchical power. She only was interested uh, to have influence with her competence and creativity and uh, brought them to the point that they started to bargain who has which kind of power in the system and they started to work together. And especially in the humanistic psychologically, psychological uh, milieu, many people are still uh, not clear about the importance of building up good systems of power. And if you go in self-experience, it's, it's interesting to find out uh, whom do I, uh, whose power do I accept? Uh, am I biased? I am one-sided, so that I only accept hierarchical power, or I only accept uh, professional qualification power and neglect hierarchical power. And many of conflicts derive from being one-sided or immature on that. And to find out what, what is my, my culture of empowerment of others and need I to enlarge that and can we talk about that? Maturity, that's also a key word that's important to me. Uh, we very often, uh, we have a two years program in the organizational development department. In the first year, our focus is individu individual controlling. How does a person deal with himself, herself, their role to make a good job? In the second year, uh, we focus on how to say direct systems around them. Also, they are not yet finished in clarification. Uh, of their personal system. And very often we have uh, quite unexperienced people in, in roles they never could fill in. Yeah. And they are so pleased that they are now so important that they do not understand that they cannot fill that role. And the system is immature as well. They do not understand that this person cannot do what they hope this person can do. So sometimes both systems are immature uh, concerning developmental processes. And instead of starting a, a workshop and a supervision where we follow the hidden illusion when we do a good supervision job, then still maturity can be gained within that, with these resources we have. That's very often an illusion. And this is and, and then the learning group is overburdened with a challenge. And then sometimes they are frustrated or they go to a focus everybody understands but is not really focused in the organization. And this is why we developed maturity, maturity checks before we do a supervision. So the one who offers a project has five minutes to describe the project and the others just listen and get an intuitive idea. Is this person experienced enough to fulfill? 
and uh, this role, does this person have any chance with this, within our learning setting to gain so much additional competence that the chances to fulfill the role are really better? And if not, this is the first focus. Not serve the illusion that it can be done by this learning process. And sometimes the person might be mature enough but underestimates that the system in which the person wants to do his or her job is not mature enough. And then the person uh, will get exhausted when we train the person with the illusion that she, she is able then to change the system. In this case, it's important that the person learns that she's maybe already, also the work is already started, maybe it's uh, half the way, there's no chance to really come to a good end with that and to deal with that. That's uncomfortable. So this, these are concepts uh, yeah, that counteract somehow the idea that learning can self solve all problems because learning capacities are limited and we, we need to find out whether we really have a chance with the possibilities we can serve as learners and by, through a learning system really to reach what is needed. And the craziest thing is that the systems who are the most immature system have the biggest illusions what they can do. This is our second design triangle. I already showed you the design triangle for team, deciding about teams, focus and procedures. And certainly you can ask an individual as well, what is the problem definition on which you want to work? Do something, what is your focus? And if this is your focus, do you have access to a client system which has the influence to do something about. And sometimes people have a the definition, for example, is a leadership problem on the top level, but on, in their seminar are people of the third level. So the definition of the problem and the clients you can work with do not match. So either they find ways to work with the top level or they have to change their focus if they only uh, can work with third liners. You have to think about what focus can I work with them that makes sense. And if this makes together gives a good match, then you can think: Do I have the, the actions? Do I have the role? Do I have the strategy and methods uh, really to pursue this goal? This is like Toblerone model. Uh, a schema to offer you perspectives to develop questions and not to do some kind of what you can do and what is habitual to do and to deconfuse. Oh yeah, maybe this is too complicated now. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we have only five minutes left, so uh, I do not try uh, to really come to an end. To see, you see, there are some more keywords, and you have access to the charts that you can listen, read, and so on. So I only want. I, I know I gave you a hard time. <laughs> Forgive me, <laughs> but this is a, a, a way to formulate my legacy for the scene and I wanted to show the variety, what, what is possible, what, what you can use if you want to and I thank all of you <laughs> that you uh, really uh, accepted to go through that. 
uh, five minutes we have. You can, uh, if you want, just say something, give reaction uh, before we stop now. Yeah? What are you going to do during your retirement? Pardon? <laughs> what are you going to do now after your retirement? Oh, uh, I'm ri still writing and I'm around because I live on the campus where my company and, and my foundation is. So I'm sit sitting in the garden and uh, <laughs> we have about 20 people working for us. And from time to time somebody comes to me and talks to me and asks something. So I'm available. Leadership by Aura. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and when you come to the opening party right now, uh, you will be part of a small ceremony in which I get the Life Achievement Award of the German GA Association. So <laughs> it's. A, it's <laughs> So I take this as a finishing up and I wish you a very pleasant further conference, professional life and that you can fix and bring together all the things you want to develop in your life and that you can look as satisfied as I do back to your long working period. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs>